Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Talal Tuqan, and today I'm going to be talking about how I, uh, how we can apply lessons from modern physics in the Middle East. Now, I personally love physics. Uh, my interest in it was sparked in the ninth grade in my first ever physics class, and we were studying uh, classical physics. And what classical physics is, it is, is the perception of the world like a giant clock where all the elements of the universe work together like gears and cogs in this clock. I say sparked because it didn't develop into this uh, incredible passion of mine until I was introduced to modern physics. Now this happened over time. Every once in a while, i would hear something incredibly strange about it, like uh, time travel is theoretically possible. And then uh, I got a glimpse of it when I watched a um, documentary on the Discovery Channel. And everything they said was so unorthodox and strange, it completely consumed my attention. <coughs> like, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, light wasn't just energy. It has, had a speed. Uh, the universe was that huge. Uh, there are more than three dimensions. Therefore, if I had to uh, define modern physics, I would say it's uh, the world behind the world we perceive. It's uh, basically the things, whether on a subatomic or planetary level, that we don't notice that keep our universe going. Uh, take the atom. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, take the atom, uh, the thing that the universe is made up of. And uh, take any ordinary size atom and stretch it out. Imagine it's the size of a football pitch. Now, the uh, nucleus, which is known as the center of the atom, would be the size of an apple at the center of the football pitch, while the electrons, the things that orbit the atom, would be the size of grains of sand on the outside of the pitch. Uh, what do you notice about this uh, analogy? We can assume it means that most of an atom is empty, correct? Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that the entire human race, consisting of 7 billion people, can be squeezed into matter the size of a sugar cube. You can't find that in biology, can you? So, Anyway, back to the purpose of my speech. I believe what we're doing is using the physical world as a guide to our political world. So classical physics, this very rigid, very absolute perspective, is like our perception of the Middle East today, uh, well, before the Arab Spring. However, with this incredible development, everything has changed. Uh, what we thought was permanent turned out to be uh, variable. What we thought was uh, impossible became recurrent. Uh, sorry. Uh, what we thought was impossible turned out to be recurrent. Therefore, uh, this may well be the period of uncertainty that became, uh, that, that happened between classical physics and modern physics. Therefore, today I'm here to talk about the things we can learn from physics and how we can apply them in the Middle East. The first thing we can learn from is the speed of light. Uh, in classical physics, uh, the speed of light is uh, infinite. Therefore, everything you're seeing you're seeing at this instant, because light does not need time to reach you. So, for example, the sun. You're seeing the sun now, according to classical physics. However, uh, modern physics says that, in fact, uh, the speed of light is finite and is actually equal to 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, what this means is that it takes time for light to reach you from uh, distant objects. Therefore, uh, in the case of the sun, you're actually, when you look at the sun, you're seeing what it looked like eight minutes ago. Now, how can you apply this uh, to the Middle East? Well, uh, looking through the glasses of classical physics, we see, that, uh, we see the Arab world now. However, uh, with this insight from modern physics, we see that what we're looking at is actually the past. And what I mean by this is that the effect comes long after the cause. So uh, for those who say, look at Egypt, it's been a year, nothing's happening, well, the effect hasn't reached yet. So whether it takes one year or ten, we have to wait for the change that we want. 
The next concept I'm going to be talking about is space and time. Now, classical physics says that they're uh, both completely separate and definite, uh, while modern physics is a bit different. You see, this man, uh, Minkowski, stated that they're actually one joint concept called space-time. Uh, this space-time has four dimensions, three of which are for space, which is uh, where the term three-dimensional or 3D comes from, and one of them for uh, time. Now, how can we relate this to the Arab world? Well, lots of people nowadays in the Arab world have completely separate and opposing ideas with the classical physics view. However, with the modern physics view, we find that there's actually a central point between these views uh, that, that, that works. So basically, there's a perfect mixture of them that forms this fabric, which brings me to my next idea, uh, <coughs> which uh, relativity tells us that the, these dimensions uh, are weaved in together and form a fabric. This fabric uh, contains lo large masses on it. And uh, like, any, uh, like any fabric, with large mass comes l large curves, uh, such as planets. You can see it here in this picture. It is like any planet. And, and this explains why uh, uh, pa uh, planets orbit the sun. Uh, it, you, this video would explain it in more detail. This is a clip from um, the TV movie Einstein and Eddington. So I hope you like it. So you got the point. Now, uh, relating this to uh, the Arab world, classical physics tells us that uh, the power structure doesn't have an effect on surroundings. However, modern physics says that it actually does. So a stra stable structure like democracy will have a greater impact on, uh, on the fabric, which in this case is the Middle East. and. Uh, it will allow masses to fall in line with it and uh, revolve around it. The final thing we can learn, oh yeah, so here's democracy. The final thing we can learn about <coughs> from physics is the relation between energy and mass. Before I go ahead, I want to define the terms. Uh, mass is basically stuff. It's uh, physical objects that you can feel and like they're made out of atoms. While energy is what allows us to uh, m create forces and change. Uh, classical physics tells us that, once again, these are two completely separate uh, things. However, uh, modern physics perspective is basically shown in this equation, E equals mc squared. Now, this is a f probably the most famous uh, equation in all of science, but what does it mean? Well, it basically means that energy can be converted uh, to mass and mass to energy. This is uh, done through a very complicated process. However, uh, that's, that's involving nuclear physics, and we won't get into that. Um, anyway, so here's an example. Take an ordinary sized lemon. Let's say it, uh, it weighs 111 grams. Now, plugging it into the equation, we see that it produces 10 quadrillion uh, kilojoules which doesn't, like, it doesn't mean anything to us, so let, let me put it in uh, better terms. Uh, it means that it could power 11 million and a half light bulbs for a day if you theoretically use every amount of energy in it. So uh, how can we relate this to uh, uh, the Middle East? Well, classical physics tells us that some people are like energy. They have influence and power over the world, while others are just mass. They're stationary objects. They can't 
affect anything without energy. However, uh, modern physics says that you can actually choose uh, which one you are. This can, this can be related to the idea that uh, this, this relates to the tendency Arabs have uh, to, to sit and wait for change to happen and for their conditions to improve. And it, it reminds me of a, a, a song lyric by the Beatles in their song, uh, Revolution. Uh, Arabs also have a tendency to be extremely negative when it comes to um, like, uh, improvement and uh, <coughs> change. And this is perfectly illustrated by uh, His Majesty's uh, interview with uh, Farid Zakaria of CNN. Question. This is the 10th year of your, um, of, of your assignment in China, correct? Um, in this period, you have really uh, dramatically transformed Jordan's economy. Uh, it's a country that has no natural resources and has been growing steadily and strongly. What did you do and what has been most effective? What is the lesson in terms of creating growth? Okay, so you got what I mean. <coughs> uh, when I put a picture up of this man, probably everyone in the room instantly recognizes him. Can anyone tell me who he is? Okay, Einstein, yeah, Albert Einstein. However, when I put a picture up of this man, <laughs> does anyone know who he is? Not, f uh, not uh, a lot of people recognize him. Uh, his name is Arthur Eddington, and he's actually the reason uh, behind Einstein's fame. You see, um, in 1916, uh, Einstein had published his second uh, paper on relativity. However, in the, uh, in the, he wasn't recognized by the scientific community as being uh, br as brilliant as he is. And uh, not a lot of people believed in him, but a few did, one of whom was Eddington. So they had, be, they had been exchanging letters for years. However, due to World War I um, and the tension between Britain and Germany, uh, he was, uh, Eddington was uh, prohibited from communicating with Einstein. However, he continued to be persistent. And in order to prove Einstein right, he asked him to give a prediction uh, about the real world based on his uh, theory of relativity. And what Einstein said was basically that uh, starlight bends due to the mass of the sun uh, in space-time, as you can see by this picture. It's, it's, uh, it's not simple, but it, like, this is the simplified uh, version of it. And um, so what Eddington did was he carried out an expedition to prove Einstein right, and sure enough, he did. And here's a photograph from that expedition. And you can see the starlight a bit from the side, but it's bent. <coughs> so basically, why did I mention him? Well, uh, Eddington believed in Einstein, and he helped him when everyone else uh, didn't believe in him. Therefore, uh, I'm proposing today that we be the Middle East's uh, Eddington, that we uh, believe in it when everyone else has given up hope, and that we make it famous for the great things it has, like its culture and its heritage, rather than its violence and its conflicts. Thank you.